Hey all, welcome to another episode of On the Ball. It stands for best best advice and life lessons, a podcast show where I focus on extracting best advice and life lessons from world class performers and leaders from various fields by deconstructing and teasing out the routines, success habits, tactics, techniques, hacks, tricks, secrets, and best advice or life lesson that they have ever received so that you can use and apply to your own life and work. I'm more interested in learning about things my guests have never said or shared before. So today, I'm thrilled to have Jeff Deeper on the show. Jeff needs no introductions, but I would like to share a few things about him, the multifaceted leader that he is. You don't want to miss this episode at all. So Jeff is currently the CVP of Microsoft Teams, SharePoint and OneDrive at Microsoft. Having started at Microsoft as a developer evangelist more than 25 years ago, and he is still inspired by that singular principle of empowering others uh, with Microsoft platform. Jeff is a multifaceted leader. I've known him for a while. He's known as the founder of SharePoint, first released some 19 years ago with hundreds of millions of users and billions in terms of revenues. He writes and records music as hobby, plays the guitar, and his role model is Walt Disney. So in his current role, Jeff leads the product and engineering teams for Microsoft 365, including Microsoft Teams, OneDrive, and SharePoint that empower more than 1 billion people around the world to collaborate at work, home, and school. Today, we also have a guest on the show, Aniket Naravanekar, as part of the Microsoft Giving Campaign that supports our employees' passion for giving. Each October, a fun and spirited employee giving campaign, a tradition since 1983, makes a significant annual impact in addition to generous giving year-round. Welcome to the show, Jeff and Aniket. Let's play ball. Thanks, Srini. Hey, Aniket. It's great to, great to be here with you both. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm stoked to be a part of this episode with both of you. Great to have you all. Thank you. Hey, there is so much to talk about, Jeff. Let's jump right in. Uh, first of all, uh, as you stepped in as the leader for Microsoft Teams, and during that time of the pandemic hit, right, the whole world went online. Since then, Teams has seen phenomenal growth in terms of customer adoption, rate of innovation, and how it's literally changed the way people communicate and organizations collaborate and learn. And just recently, Teams was recognized as the leader in UCAS and Meeting Solutions Magic Quadrant by Gartner. Congratulations on that, Jeff. Give me your perspective of this. How has the journey been so far? And what surprised you the most about the product, our customers, you know, the education and learning field, et cetera? Yeah, well, I've been at Microsoft for over 25 years, and I've seen a lot of sea changes in technology, the rise of the, the web, uh, mobile, cloud, and the rapid pace of innovation and customer adoption and competition in the industry, but nothing remotely close to what we all experienced in the last year in terms of compression of all this change. Um, and so really, I start with, it's been a privilege to be part of the team's organization that you and Aniket and many, many others have done a great job uh, building the product, building the customer and partner relationships so that we could be a part of you know, such amazing growth. And as you know, the growth of Teams was already unprecedented in the history of Microsoft. It was the fastest growing uh, business software we'd ever done, even in pre-COVID. Uh, so the organization was tuned for growth, but nothing like what we what we saw. And so there's, you know, on the one hand, it's a privilege, but on the other hand, as a leader, you can't sit around and say, "Wow, oh, I." I'm so lucky to be here. Isn't this great? <laughs> you have to do your job as a leader that just like the team is doing an amazing job writing software, working with customers. It's my my responsibility to work with the team to make sure our priorities are clear. We've uh, allocated uh, the resources 
uh, to execute on those priorities. We have the right feedback loops and metrics on our business and with customers. We are communicating very, very clearly and simply with all our stakeholders from Satya and our senior leadership team and the Microsoft Board of Directors to our customers and partners and investors and so forth. I just did a uh, with Amy Hood's team an investor fireside chat. Uh, so uh, I was ready when uh, Brian McDonald, who did an amazing job founding teams and leading it through its growth, when he retired, I was very Shah and Satya Nadella asked me to take on this role, but I was pretty, we were all very clear that this is a very important product for our customers and for Microsoft. So I was geared up to try to be the best leader I could of an amazing team in a very dynamic industry. And so when the, you know, when the virus started to spread and we had to scale our service and add new features at a faster rate, we just went and did it. You know, you follow the, the lessons that you've all you know, clear priorities, clear resources, great people, coaching, um, and clear repetitive communication. So uh, we can go into more detail, but that that's sort of the overview. Got it, Jeff. I think that was um, really an awesome growth from where we were to where we are within three years. And, um, you know, Teams is uh, pretty fortunate to have you as a leader um, in terms of the next stage of the growth. Aniket, did you have, uh, do you have any questions on this topic as well? I, I do, thanks Rainy. Um, so uh, Jeff, COVID-19 has changed the way people communicate both at work and in their personal lives. So I'm curious, how do you see communication platforms evolving and what do you think are the next big challenges, right? For teams and just communication services ecosystem in general? Yeah. Uh, one thing, you know, especially when you have a very general purpose product like Teams, you recognize talking to customers that people's communications needs vary a lot. Uh, a teacher trying to run a class with 35th graders is different than a doctor trying to have a very life critical consultation with a patient in a one on one conversation. Somebody who's pitching an investor community is, you know, very different than say a brainstorming session with a set of peers coming up with a new product design. And so what we've, you know, it's, it's and it was part of the soul of Teams, is that the, and very much the soul of Microsoft to have flexible communication software that can span the spectrum from ad hoc calls and chats to more long lived conversations to meetings. And even within each of those that, you know, again, there's a difference between a meeting that's sort of one on one versus informal brainstorming versus formal presentations. And so you see us doing more features. You already see some of them we've announced and there's more to come about that spectrum of communications uh, from the fun and ad hoc to the more formal uh, you know formal presentation you know big high stakes public event and so forth uh, so you know we're we're focused on both the fundamentals of teams the simplicity the performance the reliability the quality but also evolving the communications tools so they can adapt for what's different from a teacher versus a doctor versus a brainstorming group versus a sales pitch. Uh, and I think you'll see more innovation in teams uh, along that spectrum. Got it. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, Jeff, your career path is pretty unique uh, in the sense that you have one company on your resume and that is Microsoft. Um, I've seen very few resumes like that. Tell me about that. How did you get started? Yeah. Uh, and what do you love about the company and how do you stay inspired after 25 years? Yeah, actually, 
So I started working in an, a small investment firm in New York when I was in college, and I worked there during college, after college, and then a year after. Um, and so I was there for about five years doing software development for this investment firm, you know, ultimately leading a couple of developers. And even I had a salesperson working for me because we were selling, you know, our, your, our uh, software for portfolio analytics. Mm -hmm. And so I was in a great situation. My wife was a native New Yorker and her family was there. And it just, um, you know, I thought software was the thing that was going to change the world and Microsoft was going to be the center of gravity of it. And so when my wife, uh, my fiance, then wife and I came back from our honeymoon, literally the Sunday after we got back, uh, I applied for a job at Microsoft in the New York Times uh, want ads. That's how you did it back then. There was no <laughs> LinkedIn, Indeed, That's Monster, et cetera. Um, because I thought Microsoft was going to change the world. And so I, I joined Microsoft in 1992, um, took this big risk to, you know, in fact, my my parents called up my wife and said he shouldn't leave this really great job in New York with this great company to go to risky Microsoft. And my wife said he's going to do what he's going to do. And she, of course, uh, came with me and she got a job at Microsoft, too. And then you know, there's been a couple other times in my career at Microsoft where I pivoted a little bit. And so people know the part where I've been working on the same thing in the same collaborative space for 20 years. But in the first, you know, five to eight years of my career at Microsoft, there was a couple of reboots uh, where I took uh, some risks. And so, you know, that, yeah, I think the thing to take away from my experience is don't just, you know, don't go stick on something for 20 years if it's not the thing that's clicking for you or you need some new experiences. Uh, I actually took a few risks pretty early on in the first 10, 12 years of my career. I see. That's fascinating. And was there a turning point in your career, Jeff? I mean, besides that big one when you moved Lock, Stock and Barrel from New York um, around 1992, was there another was that a turning point? Is that another turning point? Yeah. What did you learn from that? Yeah, so two two to go through. Actually, I'll do three. One was uh, I started as a developer evangelist in Microsoft because I wasn't sure what I was going to go do. And so much like your team, Srini, I was out you know, talking to customers and partners, and it was my job to help them write better code for Win, uh, the then new Win32, Windows NT, OLA2, and so uh, and then that led to a job where I helped uh, the Visual Basic team launch Visual Basic 2, which was the version of Visual da Basic that had data access. Uh, it's fun to think about what Visual Basic was like without data access in Visual Basic 1. But anyway, yeah. um, and that grew into, uh, I was wound up being a director of marketing. And just like when I was in New York, I sort of found this, yeah, this is, this is a good job, but it's not what I want to do. And so I went and interviewed for a couple of jobs in Microsoft and said, hey, I'm a director of marketing. I want to get back to software. I was a developer before. Mm. Uh, you know, I'd love to have a you know, GPM or director of GPM job. And I kind of got laughed at by some <laughs> people I really respected. And they said, well, if you want to do this, go ahead. But you're going to have to start over and learn how to do the work of in the engineering teams at Microsoft. And a number of my colleagues said, that's crazy. Don't take a step back. And but I did. So I went from managing 30 people as a director of evangelism and marketing to being a individual contributor PM for I took the hardest problem that the team had, which was security and directory work uh, in the Internet services group so that I could prove my mettle on security protocols uh, and directory protocols. Uh, you know, we built a LDAP server, if you remember back in yep. early days of the Internet. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I pitched that we take some of the software and we create a product out of it for other customers and it became a product called Site Server. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a few other people who worked on that. There was a guy named Satya Nadella that worked on the <laughs> commerce part of it. There was a guy named Terry Myerson whose company we bought 
that did the analytics part. And SiteServer was a terrible product. So reboot number two came from in Microsoft was we canceled SiteServer and nobody fired me uh, for this failure of a product. They said, yeah, okay, what do you want to do next? And I said, man, it's so obvious. Bring web intranet mm. experiences together with document management and search. And we created this group that was we called PKM, Publishing and Knowledge Management, mm. that was going to bring, you know, build a web-based document management system that we connected to Office so you could make a website and save your documents to it. And it was so obvious. You know, I remember at the time thinking, how did I get lucky enough that the company hadn't done this before? It's the most obvious opportunity <laughs> in the world for Microsoft. And so out of the ashes of site server, we created this thing uh, in PKM called Tahoe that became SharePoint. And it was not an overnight success. We had to work very hard at it. And then we, um, and then uh, it you know became a success. And then we launched the cloud version, which was, you know, as you know well, <laughs> years and years of work. Yeah. Um, and then sort of the last pivot for me was in 2014, you know, I've been on this Office 365 SharePoint for a while. I was, you know, I needed sort of a fresh perspective. And I didn't, you know, I was even thinking about leaving the company and doing a startup. And uh Satya had just become CEO and they suggested I come run corporate strategy. And I said, okay, I'll do it for a year. So I went to work for Amy Hood, our CFO, and we worked on some acquisitions. Um, some we did, some we didn't do. Uh, many you know, were uh, really successful. Uh, and I learned a ton watching Satya and Amy and others. But I, you know, nine months into the 12 month assignment, I, I went to Satya and, and I, you know, was still staying in touch with Rajesh and saying, other people can do this. I cannot give up other people advice for a living. I have to build. Uh, and so Satya said, don't worry about it. And then I got this mail from him that said, SharePoint needs you back. Come into my office tomorrow morning. And I, you know, I talked to him and said, should you really go home again? Should you do the same thing twice? Is that really <laughs> growth? And he said, well, what do you think? And I said, oh boy, you know, we are just getting started. You know, we could really remake the runtime of SharePoint using some you know, modern open source JavaScript technology. We could power the experience with some more AI. You know, we could connect it to more communications tools. I said, go, go, go. So, uh, sort of the third time. And then uh, he and Rajesh asked me to run Office uh, PM and Design for a while. And then in December this year, they asked uh, me to run Teams. Uh, so yeah, there was, uh, it's it's not as simple and linear as it looked, even though you look at the resume and say, wow, you've been doing this for 20 years. Like, uh, did, didn't you ever think about doing anything new? There was actually three or four pretty pivotal parts in my life where I did think about doing something new and ultimately did most of the time. That is so fascinating, Jeff. I mean, you answered a couple of different questions that I had in there in anticipation. Like I was going to ask you about SharePoint. How did that happen? So thanks for answering that. And that's pretty fascinating. I think your journey from site server, PKM, SharePoint, what became SharePoint, and also, um, you know, the turning points. You had three different turning points in your career. So Jeff, I think one question that I was always curious about when I talk to leaders, I'm sure everybody has tough challenges that they overcome. Uh, many tough challenges, like you said, over the course of many years. It's non-linear, right? Your career path. If you were to reflect back and think about one or two toughest, the hardest challenges that you faced, what would they be and how did you overcome? What made it so hard? Yeah, I'll give you a couple. So when we went and did what became SharePoint, we did it in the office organization and people inside and outside Microsoft told me repeatedly, office doesn't do servers. Mm -hmm. That's for the server team and uh, you know, there were some senior executives at Microsoft who told me that. There were uh, some Gartner analysts who told me this. And I said, what are you, crazy? There's apps and platforms, and app runs on the client and server, and platforms run on the client and server. 
And so if we're going to build an innovative new app, I can't just store this stuff in the file system. I need, you know, metadata, business logic that runs in the server. And, you know, there was a few internal battles in where I had to make the case, you know, the future of applications is client server and the right way to organize was apps and platforms, not client and server teams. And so eventually we got, we executed enough where, you know, it's it's like amazing to tell the story in retrospect now because people were saying, like, what are you kidding? Uh, yeah, the, there's not some Spotify app and that's different than the company that builds the Spotify service. Everything's a client service uh, app. Uh, but at the time, you know, it was a sea change. But the one that's probably worth talking about the most is the cloud. Uh, as you know, we took Exchange, SharePoint, and uh, Link, uh, and then later Skype for Business. And because it was the thing that was most seamless for our customers, we took those three server products, hosted them, while we refactored their architectures for what we would need for the future of the cloud. Uh, so multi-tenant, uh, active, active failover, elastic, um, you know, multi-geo, and on and on and on and on. That's certainly not how any of the, either of those three code bases existed at the beginning. And so there was one battle in turn, you know, with folks who said, you should throw all that stuff out and start from scratch. And we said, wow, of course, that would be probably an easier way to have a pure native cloud architecture, but that would be disruptive to all our customers and partners investments in it. And so is that really the play we should take? And people were like, well, we get why you're doing what you're doing, but uh, we really think your existing architecture is going to hold you back. And as you know, we've rewritten the core. You know, we still call the technology SharePoint and still call the technology Exchange. Uh, Skype for Business, we renamed three times and it's now Teams. Uh, this, this, the back end service is actually, we call it internally IC3. Um, but we re re rewrote much of the infrastructure on that while we preserved compatibility with our, for the most part, with our customers' existing investments. So that was one side of going the cloud that was harder, that was hard. The other side was right out of the book, uh, Innovator's Dilemma, Clay Christensen, where he talks in that book about when there's a sea change in tech, one of the worst things you can do is listen to your customers too literally because customers told us not to go to the cloud. In fact, there was this meeting with Rajesh, me, and PJ Hawk, who ran the office team, where we asked our 100 biggest customers how many were going to the cloud this is about 2012 or so, Office 365. And 10% of the room raised their hands. And we said, no, no, not now, but ever. And <laughs> a few more hands raised. And after that meeting, we said, wow, if we listen to our customers and the pace we're going to the cloud, we will be dead. All these other tech companies will steamroll us. We, with all due respect and love for our customers in IT, we got to not we've got to lead them and not listen to them and even 2014 this is sort of the last you know the last sort of hard test we had austin texas i, I think it was austin texas it was in texas i keynoted with perry clark in white the exchange conference and the sunday before the exchange conference we had probably a hundred of the exchange MVPs from our partner ecosystem where we had a fireside chat and they just came after me. They said, you guys are idiots. Stop talking about the cloud. Uh, it's not going to happen. Maybe for small companies, maybe, but big companies never. Uh, and it got kind of, there was a few people in the room that got kind of nasty uh, about it. Most people, you know, the, most of them weren't, but it was really tough. And I kept thinking about Innovator's Dilemma and thinking, oh my gosh, uh, how do I tell our best partners they're wrong and I'm not gonna listen to them? And the more I tried, the angrier a few of them went, got. And so anyway, you know, you all see more than a quarter billion users for Microsoft 365. You see Microsoft's market cap, biggest number one in SaaS, you know, pushing hard, uh, 
closing in on Amazon and and platform as a service. Uh, but there were it was tough, both with the skeptics who wondered whether we could re-architect our services for the cloud, uh, and uh, our partners who said we should never go to the cloud. And because we loved them but didn't listen to them, when COVID hit in March and we needed to scale the meeting minutes of Teams up 20-fold, we had an architecture that could do it. Uh, we did uh, change the engine on the train so that it could scale elastically to hundreds of millions of users from our origin as single tenant server products. So I am pretty proud of that uh, and incredibly proud and fortunate to work with people who worked for a decade plus in the face of a lot of skeptics internally and externally. Uh, I don't know if that's what you were looking for, but that that was a pretty hard journey. It looks easy now, but it was hard in the middle. <laughs> No, that's uh, that's a pretty amazing inside track, Jeff. Even I have to say, meaning I didn't know exactly what you were going through at the time. Uh, this goes back. I can't help but think in terms of uh, Steve Jobs also saying, "Hey, customers don't know what they want, right?" He famously eschewed market research to some extent and relied on, "Hey, I think it's important for us to invent the future." I think it's great uh, to listen to that. Yeah, it's so obvious in retrospect where he said, look, 90% of the time you're looking at the phone, you're not tapping on the keyboard. So why not have the screen be full screen to optimize the 90% of the time? But when they totally. launched it, it wasn't the first screen with a uh, phone with a soft keyboard, it wasn't. But it was the, the biggest and highest quality. They, they spent a lot of, you know, they've had a very high priced phone. And now everybody, oh, it's obvious you don't have a hard keyboard on a phone. But at the time, people kind of laughed at him. Totally. I think it doesn't mean that you don't listen to your customers, but I think it's a fine balance, you would say, in terms yeah. of market research, customer voice versus what you think is uh, the path for the future. That's pretty fascinating. Aniket, you were in Windows storage as well, right? I think it reminds me that uh, you were in Windows storage. Um, and I think, um, do you have a question? Do you, you, maybe you want to get in a question here for Jeff along the lines? Yeah, of absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, uh, so yeah, the, the uh, listening to the innovators dilemma in, uh, in, in the org that I'm part of is actually pretty fascinating. So something that is also fascinating to me is um, about leaders in addition to things that they do is things that they do less of which allows them to focus more on important things so jeff the question that i have for you is like what are some of the things that you do less of and how has that affected your professional and personal life yeah that's a good question um i It, you know, it's interesting. We were talking about this the other day because in in our leadership team for Teams and SharePoint and Wondra, uh, I spend a lot of time with you know our team, what's going on with customers and technologies, brainstorming, and ultimately deciding together what we're going to go build. But I try to not have these formal meetings where people read slides to us. It's not that I don't want the details. It's just I can read a slide deck uh, with an overview of something nine times out of 10 dramatically faster than you know it can be presented. Because we're all taught as presenters when you know, you've got to be slow and clear and detailed. Uh, to make sure you don't lose your audience, which is great when you know that's your only option. Uh, but I'm I'm very much in the weeds of what we're building and want to know all the details and wallow in the customer feedback. But if I can read it in five minutes, that's way better than somebody taking an hour to walk me through it. So I've actually and I've always done this, but it's gotten uh, more 
of a more important to me now that we're all in these remote meetings and meeting eight, 10 hours in a row is hard where where I'll say to the team, look, I would love to meet you, meet with you guys. I, you know, I'd love to talk about people's growth, their careers. I'd love to brainstorm, um, talk about some technical issues, you know, figure out how we make decisions. All that's just great, but please don't, you know, walk me through 60 slides on a status of a project that I could read myself in 10 minutes. I promise you, I will do that before the meeting. Um, and so that I think is something I pride, pride myself on. In fact, we have, uh, it was like a running joke in the SharePoint team that when they used to come in and try, we had these checkpoint reviews and before, back before when it was an obvious thing to send out pre-reading, I would go peek. I knew where the SharePoint site A day or two, I would learn a lot about yeah. like who was doing their decks early, who was doing them late, who was high level, who was low level, and not to say you know everybody's got different ways of working, but yeah, if I had like fifteen minutes during lunch to go, I'll peek at the team's work product because that's as a leader, if you only rely on these very polished reviews where somebody builds the fifty slide deck and walk it through you. You, you don't you miss a lot and so i like to be whether it's lurking in sharepoint to see the docs that they're preparing for these reviews or in the teams channel you know srini as you know you guys have a, a teams customer channel i read it multiple times a day as people paste post issues about hey we're facing this issue with that customer um we we do our status in things like azure devops you know again that's a chance for me to see like did the team have to spend a week prepping the fancy deck on our project status or do they just keep it up to date in in our engineering systems so i'd go into these sharepoint reviews having peeped at the slides and surprised and maybe even frustrated the presenter where i'd say at the beginning okay i read your deck it's great thank you so much for making it it's very educational i don't want you to walk it through me i want to talk about these three things where i was either not clear what your plan was or i think we we're not fully aligned and let's talk about it and when I first started doing that, people were really frustrated. Like, wait, wait, I did all this deck. Let me walk it through you. No, I got it. I got it. So <laughs> yeah. anyway, I've probably beaten a dead horse, but that I think is pretty key for a leader to not spend all day having people present to them, which is can be very inefficient. No, talk about focusing and uh, you know being very efficient with, uh, with time. That's good advice. Yeah, and I, I just have to, I just have Sorry. to say that that's uh, the team listening to that is there are going to be some people that are going to be very nervous about where they <laughs> store their decks and documents. No, I know, but it's okay. I promise, I never sent <laughs> yeah, mail to anybody and said, "Oh my God, what you wrote in the first draft was so lame." Look, I, I've written lame emails myself, and I throw them out and start over. It's okay. It's okay. Um, yeah, the other thing I do is. I don't want somebody to take Power BI and spend two days turning Power BI into a fancy PowerPoint slide for me. Uh, so in the whenever I see some new view of data, when somebody presents it to me, and Serena, you've probably seen this, yeah. Yeah. I'll say, what's the link to the Power BI? And they say, oh no, like it's off to the side and like we massage the data and it's like, like, no, that's if you're giving me an answer like that, that's a symptom of bad hygiene. I want to <laughs> look at the same exact data that you're looking at. And when we come into these meetings, we can talk about the insights from the data or what we're going to do about it. But don't tell me I can't see the the all the dashboards for everything we're doing uh, and draw my own conclusions or ask questions from the data. Uh, you know, don't don't be so buttoned down, protective. No, that's awesome. Yeah, I know you said that during meetings as well, Jeff. I think that's good advice. And anyone who's listening to this podcast after, hey, that's a great advice from Jeff. Um, I think uh, it's important to how do we maximize time? 
Hey, most Jeff, of my most yeah. of my browser favorites are links to either Power BI dashboards or equivalent things, or links to uh, you know the things that monitor. We use a different system, not Power BI. You know something you know called Jarvis. You guys are familiar mm -hmm. with Jarvis. Yep. Um, to see what the service is. So if I want to, at a moment's notice, see how hot our CPUs are running in a France data center, I can go do that. I don't have to ask anybody's advice or permission or help. I can just go look. No, that's that's so obvious, Jeff. I still, you know, I think some some get into the old habit of trying to slap a Power BI onto a slide, which is two days old. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't make sense at all. Hey, Jeff, switching gears. Yeah. The one thing that I'm always interested in learning, and I'm sure most people would do as well in terms of the rituals and habits of leaders, right? Let's talk a little bit about your morning rituals and what does your typical day look like? What does your first 60 to 90 minutes look like? What's your boot up sequence, if you will? Yeah. Um, so I, uh, gosh, it should be really accurate. Uh, most mornings I'll wake up and on my way to shaving and brushing my teeth, I will look at Teams, look at Outlook, and look at Twitter uh, and see if there's anything where the world's on fire uh, or if there's anything fun to celebrate. But I'll spend no more than like five minutes doing that. Uh, I will then go uh, have breakfast and uh, my vice is I drink too much Diet Coke, so I'll have <laughs> Diet Coke as opposed to coffee uh, since you asked. Uh, and then I would say two days a week I go to the gym uh, to work out with a trainer on strength training. I did that today. And four days a week I will go run. I, um, you know, I build the training plan for myself. And so some days are recovery runs, some days are hill repeats, some days are long runs and so forth. And then I will uh, sit down to, to come down to the den and, and start working. And like a lot of people through this, uh, I'm finding I'm working extra, you know, because you don't have the commute and you're right there, you you just jump into work half an hour earlier, which is good and bad because, you know, you need to set an example for the team and you need to take breaks yourself. Uh, but that's uh, in a nutshell what I'll do. And I'm one thing I've learned that's very people are very different about is I am a zero inboxer. Mm. Uh, and so I will uh by you know 9 30 try to found uh, nothing in my inbox i use microsoft to do uh and so i have two lists in to do one for my personal life and one for my work life i try to keep um actually i should mention this before the email so i i used to do a personal life and work life and Things have a star on them if the next action's on me, and things are unstarred if I'm waiting for somebody else. Um, and I try very hard to keep no more than seven things on either my work or home to-do list, because I believe at that point you're kidding yourself uh, about how you keeping your head at once. And so right now I'm looking at it, I have six things on my work list, and two things on my home list, that's not too bad. Um, and uh, now some of those things are a big thing, like coming up our, with our plan for the next calendar year for teams uh, in December is a, obviously, you know, many subtasks. So I will try, before I dive into email, I will try to flip my all my stars where I'm the blocker to unstars where I'm waiting for somebody else uh, but I'll look at those to see if we're overdue or not. And then I'll sort of get lost in email for a little bit while I try to zero inbox. Uh, and uh, that's the, probably the first, you know, one to two hours of every every day. Right on. Got it, Jeff. Um, 
that is a lot to unpack in there. You gave a lot of nuggets there. I'll probably do that after the show in the interest of time. But one thing I have to say, you are quite a pace setter in terms <laughs> of your responsiveness to emails, chat. I've seen that personally myself. That's a bad. That's a bad thing, though. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, you probably know when you do these leadership assessment yeah. analyses at Microsoft. Um, I don't know if we use the same one, but in the middle part of my career, your the word you used was exactly what uh, came back, and they said pace setter. And I, my first reaction was like, "Oh, this is great!" You know, people say I'm um, you know driving very forward and setting a good example, uh, but not micromanaging. You know, that's great, right? Being a pace setter is great. And they sat me down and said. No, <laughs> that can be very intimidating to people and can encourage them to have bad habits uh, and a lot of anxiety that isn't maximizing productivity. So, yes, sadly, I am a recovering sort of coping pace setter. I got it. Yeah, that's and fun. apologize. I apologize <laughs> for any harm I've caused you and your team. <laughs> No, I think I am guilty of that too, to some extent. Um, I am, and I try not to. I, I mean, it, it's so hard not to reply or send emails after quote unquote business hours. I mean, the whole business yeah. hour thing is blurring these days, but uh, it's so hard to do it, not because you can't, but you don't want the others to jump on things when they don't have to. Well, yeah, that's the, um, for sure, I've, tr I've tried to moderate uh, outside of business hours. I think even during business hours, the, the bad thing that I could be conveying that I don't mean to is confusing the urgent with the important. You know, one of the, I forgot which book, you know, the, who my, my cheese or seven habits of highly effective people. And one of the books, you know, stressed, and it's been rewritten in 50 different books that if you, confuse the urgent for the important, you'll never do the important that's not urgent. And so I didn't sort of finish the story about the rest of the day, but I do I do use to do to try to make sure I've got the list that's important and I'm not constantly in email. Like the last thing I'd want is a developer trying to land a new T feature for teams sitting on email all day long, you know. <laughs> Do it in the morning, do it at the beginning of the day and the end of the day for 15 to 30 minutes. And then please, please write code or be in design reviews or deal with uh, customer escalations the rest of the time. So that is the bad part of pace setting is that don't get lost in the communication tools and confuse everything for urgent. Totally. Anika, did you have a related question on this? Yeah, so uh, the tip about uh, using to do to manage both like personal life as well as professional uh, makes sense. So uh, I wanted to dig in a little bit more about that. So leading to very important products at Microsoft, right? SharePoint and Teams has got to be time consuming. So what are some of the other things that you do to juggle um, that with your personal life? Yeah, you know, so I've, uh, Unless there's some emergency, I've tried to set boundaries on my work so I can be with my family. Uh, I would say certainly not at the beginning of COVID, but once we got to the summer, most weekends I would read a lot about and work, but I definitely didn't communicate. I, you know, I wouldn't say, hey, I'm going to go ask Srini what's going on with our, you know, you know, on premises to cloud migrations. Let me write him a long email asking that. Uh, so I've tried to put boundaries uh, for sure on the weekends uh, for both my family and frankly to set an example for the team. I've also tried to take vacations. Uh, in fact, you know, one of the last posts I did in the announcements channel for the Teams team was to remind everybody, please take a vacation. And, you know, we're not scheduling meetings uh, for the most part this week. Uh, and, you know, I was very public when I took some vacation time in the summer with my family, both to set an example and um, 
and to obviously take the vacation, which was fun with my family. Uh, a former president of office, Jeff Rakes, once gave me a great uh, uh, insight about work-life balance that a company like Microsoft will hire people who are pace centers, who are very driven and self, uh, self-directed, uh, but then not regulate them. And so what we need for them to do is to have interests in their personal life. And so besides my family, I play guitar and music and I, uh, I run because if you, you know, we've all seen it. If you don't have something compelling that you really love to do, it could be riding a bike or reading books or hiking with friends or painting or cooking. You know, it's so easy to sit there and say, yeah, you know, should I read what's on the internet? I might as well just go back to work and eventually you've burned yourself out. Um, and so I, you know, I still follow this Jeff Rakes advice, which is find things outside work that you're passionate about, because if you're just lukewarm about them, work will suck you back in. There's always more work to do. Yep. Always, always, always. And you just got to create some boundaries and things you're excited about outside work. That is terrific Absolutely. advice, Thank Jeff. You. That is such great advice. Talking of which, Jeff Rakes, you just mentioned Jeff Rakes, Jeff. Um, did you have, who were your role models or mentors while growing up? Um, and do you have any now or that have been most influential to you um, throughout your career at Microsoft or otherwise? Yeah, um, I've, you know, I think, you you said in the intro, you know, my first, uh, you know, I certainly had a lot of, I was a big baseball fan as a kid growing up. And so my heroes were like all baseball players. Uh, Hank Aaron and Nolan Ryan were the pitchers and, and, and hitter, home run hitter that, uh, you know, I was just huge fans of as a kid. But once, once I sort of gravitated beyond just sports, uh, which took a while, uh, Walt Disney was the guy because I just, you know, very creative, broke new ground. I grew up in LA and so we went to Disneyland. It was just unbelievable to me that this place existed. Uh, new Disney movies would come out and, uh, you know, I later read, you know, biographies of him and stories about him and, you know, how he, you know, you know, much like we did on the cloud with Office 365, where, you know, some of our MVPs said, what are you crazy? When Disney in the 50s tried to build Disneyland uh, for whatever, you know, and there's this great series on, on Disney Plus uh, called The Imagineers that talks about the history of building Disneyland. You know, he really relied on his brother Roy to make sure they had the money because uh, Walt Disney would have run the thing out of business on his own. But boy, what what vision what what vision uh and it stemmed from a place of not accumulating a fortune but you know and bringing a new level of delight to people and so that is you know overwhelming me my the most inspiring story to to me i did as a kid you know love you know the the breakthrough of the pc era so i read everything bill said or did. I read everything Steve Jobs said or did. Um, and, um, you know, that, you know, that's been inspiring. Um, and, uh, and so I still think about, I still, if you ask me, like, well, who do you go back to? <laughs> I do think, like, what would Walt Disney do? What's the equivalent of a Walt Disney move right now? where you're doing something new to delight your customers that nobody else has done with some cool tech. Got it. No, Walt Disney was fascinating. In fact, uh, my favorite book on that is Walt Disney by Neil Gablo. Mm -hmm. I think it's a 500 pages book on him and I just love it. And he is, he's one of my role models too. Jeff, thanks for sharing that. Switching gears, talking about books. Um, Jeff, what was a, last book you read or you would read, uh, obviously nonfiction, are there any particular books that you gift often to other people that uh, can learn from or can you put on our bookshelves? Um, 
So there are a couple questions there. The last couple I read, uh, the one I'm reading now for my book club that uh, I finished recently is very in the moment of called The Great Influenza. It's a story about the, the flu in you know, 19, 18, 19 uh, that spread around. And the most fascinating part about that book is not just how we have deja vu of science and politics and tragedy and economics and so forth. It was predating that where the state of medicine in the US was kind of a joke in the 18, late 1800s, that you had to go to Germany to learn real medicine to be a real doctor. And there was this part in there about how Johns Hopkins University was founded and really was the first hardcore science experimentation research based uh, university. The, the other schools like Harvard, Yale, uh, Pennsylvania, et cetera, copied them. And so this whole story about how the US went from backwater to state of the art in science that was accelerated by the great influenza that later led to, you know, us, you know, you know, you know, you know so many scientific discoveries, vaccines, uh, DNA, et cetera. So that was pretty exciting. Uh, that was a good book. But the one that I really would recommend to people that's pretty dry was the one I read before that called The Year 1000. And it talks about what was referred to when I went to school in the US as the Dark Ages. You skipped over that period because clearly there was, you know, the ancient civilizations, Mesopotamia and Egypt, and then you got to the Enlightenment Renaissance of uh, Europe, and then you spent time on US history. But you sort of skipped this part around the year 1000 because, you know, nothing was going on. And it couldn't be more for, far from the truth. And, uh, you know, if you read about India, China, the Middle East, Africa, the South American and Central American societies, uh, all sorts of stuff going on, uh, fascinating, you know, science, religion, education, commerce, you know, all dimensions of things. Uh, and it's just a reminder uh, that be a little skeptic about a overly simplified view of history uh, because, you know, I think a lot of people know uh, the Islamic Arabic cultures, you know, picked up math and science from the Greeks and drove it forward. And it was later the Europeans who woke up to that. Instead, you know, you know, we in the U.S., we spent all our time focusing about, you know, and all other, you know, European scientists, which is great. They all did amazing work. But if it hadn't been for the Islamic uh, societies that had bridged the ancient world to that, we wouldn't have any of that knowledge. And so it was, uh, you know, just a fascinating read for all these societies. You know, there was one part about how the, uh, the head of the Ukrainian empire had to pick between uh, Christianity, Judaism, and uh, Islam to which religion they were going to run their empire on. And it was sort of, you know, he how he made as much of a political as a religious calculation when he said, well, most of my neighbors are Christians. So I think that's what the safest thing is to do. We're going to be Christian. And, uh, and so just this interplay between commerce and politics and religion and science. And I find very fascinating, you know, one book that's along these lines that I would, you know, people have probably read already, but that's great to go back to is Guns, Germs and Steel that has a whole riff on, you know, why things prospered in, the Euro in Europe uh, later on in part because there was just more domesticatable animals in Europe. You know, you didn't get the luck of the draw in South America. You know, all these animals that are more than a human being powered. And so 
these sort of big sweeping history books are, I find fun. Obviously, that's, that's <laughs> can be a little dry if that's all you read. No, thanks for that. I've, I have not read the year 1000. I did read The Guns, Germs and Steel by Jared Diamond. That's a fascinating yeah. book indeed. I will go look for this particular book. Talking about religion and the thing that you mentioned about Ukraine, that's pretty fascinating. The one piece of tidbit or interesting tidbit is, I didn't know until I was reading another book, Iran, the modern day Iran was not an Islamic country at all way back when. Yeah. That was fascinating. I could not believe that. And that's amazing. Um, so Jeff, switching gears, I know we are at time. Um, maybe there is time for one or two questions. Are you yeah. okay with that? Yeah, we can do uh, I'll be quicker on my answers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Um, just one quick question on the on books and you know, things that you read. Um, Anike, did you have a question about a device or tech product? Any of those along those lines? Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Rini. So, uh, Jeff, I'm curious, uh, what what's your a new favorite uh, piece of maybe a piece of tech or device or even a favorite app or product that you've been using uh, yeah. that you've maybe recently discovered? So one I've used for a while, but most people don't know about its existence, and it is amazing. There's a music uh, making company, software company called Ableton, and they've built a piece of hardware called an Ableton Push. And if most people looked at it, they'd say, oh, that's one of those things DJs use to launch clips. But this uh, device is far more powerful than that. It's got an eight by eight grid that you can use as a, sum, as a drum machine. Uh, instrument that can play chords and melodies, which I won't explain how clever it is relative. It's more, much more cleverly designed than a traditional music keyboard or even a guitar where learning the guitar, learning the chord shapes on it is just not, you know, the same finger position all over the thing. Uh, and you can obviously switch the keys and the chords and the sound, the, the scales, and uh, it's everything from a drum machine to uh, chords to melody to, you know, and loads all your synthesizers and sounds in it. And it is just like, you know, it's physically very beautiful. The interaction between hardware and software is great. So, and I think it's got a brilliant name. It's just called Push, which says, come push me and make music with me. So I think they've done an amazing, amazing job. Thank you. That's cool. Look it up and just watch the video. Even if you know nothing about music, the tutorial video for 60 seconds about what the thing does is freaking cool. Push. Got it. Yeah. I will put a link as well when I do the yeah. transcript. Thank you for that. Thanks, uh, Jeff. Hey, Jeff, before we wrap up, uh, just one or two questions more. What advice would you offer to someone, a kid or a student who's starting out in engineering or product roles? Um, what would you recommend aspiring kids in tech today, especially in today's world? Yeah, read or watch as much as you can. Um, like all invention in companies and in careers is the basis of synthesis of new new ideas and new technologies, play with things. Um, you know, one, when I worked for Amy Hood for that year running corporate strategy, on the evenings and weekends, one of the things I did was play with a lot of open source software, Node.js, uh, Angular, React, et cetera, uh, and started to watch how people were using web technology to build cross-platform experiences. And we, you know, when I had a chance to come back to SharePoint, we uh, basically redid the SharePoint user experience in the React technology, in part because, you know, we wanted to leverage the way the industry was, uh, the rest of the industry was evolving with web tech is because the browser core capabilities were getting more and more powerful and more and more fast. So. I would definitely, you know, learn from everybody and everything, not just in your domain, play with stuff, go install apps, go write some code to play with things, go buy products, play with things. And, you know, there's been a lot written about this, that the great moments of invention, whether you're just doing work within a company you're at and you like being at that company or you're doing a startup, 
comes in these other moments when you're playing guitar or going from a run and in the back of your brain, whatever, does some rewiring of, I saw this thing and I saw that thing and one plus one equals three and what if it was applied to this domain? Oh, and that's how you get these sort of little eureka moments that can be fun and good for your career regardless of what size company you work for. And so just go fill your brain with all sorts of random stuff and do it hands on because uh, later on your brain will wire things together in a way that's fun and and novel and hopefully rewarding. That's well advised. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Okay. Before we wrap up, one last question. Um, this is not just students or anyone, but for anyone, what is the best advice that you ever got? Or what's the best biggest lesson that you have you learned? If you'd like to share. Um, you know, there's this African proverb that people quote about if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Mm. And I was given that advice, not in those words. And that proverb has become better and better known and reused in the last several years. Uh, but early in my career, I was you know, like a lot of people, introverted. And the reason I was attracted to math in computers was because it was a solitary activity. And in fact, one of the projects that was supposed to be a group project in, in college in my computer science class, I did it all myself and told the other members of the team, hey, I'll just turn it in on all our behalf. And it was, you know, it was a, it was a a stupid thing to do, uh, but I still think about it precisely because not only was it rude, uh, it was short-sighted. Yes, you know, maybe I could have avoided discussions about what we were going to build and how and coordinating it. But if you going back to the synthesis example, if you synthesize different ideas from different people and you make it safe for everybody to contribute and inspire people, it is hard to get everybody to work together. It is like the more people you add, the more dynamics there are. It does take effort, but boy, is it rewarding. And that's kind of why I'm really excited to work on teams because it is a product where we can bring people together, and hopefully make a whole greater than the sum of the parts. Uh, so if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And hopefully you'll do it in together mode with Microsoft Teams. How about that for a plug to end it? Uh, that's awesome advice. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Okay. And, uh, Thanks, Reedy. Yeah. Thanks, Aniket. Aniket, thank you for uh, joining Thanks, us today. Jeff. Yeah. Uh, have a happy Thanksgiving. Thanks for you. Celebrate. This has been amazing. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. All. Bye.